Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast and to a new episode which looks at what could have been one of the most ambitious projects of cinema, particularly historical cinema, and that would be Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon movie or biopic. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you to please hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already to make sure you never miss any new material from the podcast. Before we begin, I would like to give a short introduction to what the cinematic landscape looks like today in order to contextualize the inability of a monumental movie or movies about Napoleon, such was Kubrick's project, to take shape and be released. It will be an episode in a few parts, which I hope you'll enjoy. When it comes to the cinematic landscape of nowadays, one focused on huge budgets, franchises, and billion-dollar profits, it is rather hard to think of historical movies, dramatized or fictionalized, that fit the profile. Cinematic masterpieces such as Silence, a long-time passion project of Martin Scorsese focused on Shushaku's Endo's novel that tells the story of two Portuguese Jesuit priests sailing to Japan in the 17th century and witnessing the brutal rejection and decimation of a Christian Japanese minority by Imperial Japanese forces. While it was a dramatization of historical events, it is still an unrecognized masterpiece that which I thoroughly enjoyed. It was a 2016 post-Christmas release in the UK, where half of the cinema viewers in the same theater left halfway through the movie, which was 2 hours and 49 minutes. With a reported budget of approximately $40 million, it only made $23.7 million worldwide, according to a box office mojo.com report. The audience reception did not come close to reflecting the craftsmanship, the very complex themes of betrayal and redemption, not to mention the cinematic window into a fascinating 17th century Japanese context. Every now and then, we will get a great movie such as A Royal Affair, a 2012 Danish historical drama set in the 18th century in Denmark and telling the remarkable story of royal physician Johann Friedrich Strunz, a mentally ill king Christian VII of Denmark and his wife Queen Caroline Matilda of Great Britain. Of course, certain events are dramatized and fictionalized and romanticized, yet regardless, these movies with the right quality production and actors and script incentivize people to take a more profound interest in history or historical figures. It is rare that independent smaller studios will make such movies that oftentimes do not get much of any publicity, and they slowly develop in time a following because of the internet and word of mouth. Now, this is not to say that there aren't history movies that perform really well. We've had the example of Braveheart in the mid-90s. And of course, the striking exceptions from all of this seem to revolve around the 20th century and the World Wars, with a plethora of movies about Germany and the Second World War being released in the last 10 to 15 years. Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk and Joe Wright's Darkest Hour with Gary Oldman as Churchill, both 2017 movies, focused on World War II and events from that period, something still very ingrained in recent human memory, arguably the the world's worst catastrophe. Whether you're German, British, Italian, Indian, American, Canadian, Japanese, or Russian, people who are not necessarily cinephiles, you will eventually go and watch something that is related to the Second World War. Even more so if Christopher Nolan, one of the most recognized and acclaimed directors of our time, is at the helm of such a project. In an increasingly monopolistic and excruciatingly mercantilistic cinematic industry, just check the top 20 box offices from the last four years, it is difficult to see directors trying to embark on passion projects such as as Silence, the one that I've just mentioned, focused on historical individuals or events. We are lucky that sometimes independent studios will give brilliant writers and directors, such as Armando Iannucci, a chance to take a satirical historical approach to the events of the death of Stalin. After the resounding success of 2001 A Space Odyssey, a film completed in 1968, it was said that by Mid-1969, Stanley Kubrick already had a biographical script for a Napoleon movie focusing on a Frenchman's life, 
a 180-minute dramatized historical documentary about the rise and fall of someone who had redefined the 19th century Europe and, to a certain extent, the world. The script itself is available as public domain on Google Docs, and I've provided a link in the description box below. The script and story itself will be covered in the next part of this episode, but for now, let us focus on the remarkable section containing the production notes at the end of the script. The movie would have taken around 150 days to shoot, plus minus 10. Most of the battles and exterior scenes would have been filmed in Yugoslavia with interior scenes shot in Italy. Interesting that nothing would have been filmed in France. Kubrick knew that in order to do justice to a character like Napoleon, he required a vast epic scene and scenes involving staggering numbers of extras, a great leading actor and a masterpiece of a soundtrack. Kubrick would also give us insight of how much a costume extra used to cost in different countries at that time. Remember, this was 1969. It would be 1920 for an extra in England, $14.28 in Spain, $24 in Italy, and unsurprisingly, most expensive was $24.30 in France. It was remarkable that Kubrick wrote about a bid received from the Romanian government, ran at the time by Nicolae Ceausescu, who offered 30,000 extras at a cost of $2 per person, without costumes, that is. Which is even more interesting, considering that at the time, Romanian filmmaker Sergiu Nicolaescu was making historical movies such as Daci, that also required a large number of extras. So the opportunity was there. A similar deal was offered by the Yugoslavian government at a rate of $5 per extra. This is in page 150 of the script. Kubrick had an acute business-like approach in order to try and convince studios to undertake colossal projects such as this, trying to convince producers that those governments from Eastern Europe would be very eager to participate in a cinematic project involving large quantities of US dollars. He was aware that lavish decorations for sets would have cost between three and six million dollars at the time a huge sum. In regards to casting, Kubrick was gloriously refreshing, saying the following, quote, As was discussed in our first meetings about Napoleon, my intention is to use great actors and new faces, and more sensibly put emphasis on the power of the story, the spectacle of the film, and my own ability to make a film of more than routine interest. End quote. This can be found on page 152 of the script. One fault that I would find with Kubrick's approach was the fact that he wanted to use the same actor for a 27-year-old Napoleon when he took command of the armies in Italy and for a 45-year-old Napoleon at Waterloo. I shall return to this point in the follow-up episode in the next part. What was impressive for a movie that was never actually made was the amount of preparatory work underwent by Kubrick and his staff. This included a collection containing a picture file of approximately 15,000 Napoleonic subjects, also intensive research of military uniforms of all different nations involved, location research, photography, the fact that Professor Felix Markham's advisorship had almost been secured, also of the legal rights of his Napoleon biography. The amount of detail was staggering, including the variation of lenses from film and photography. Stanley Kubrick had read the history, spoken to academics, and did outstanding logistical and technical research. Yet it may have not been the time for such an ambitious film to be released in the early 1970s. This brings us closer to the present, Steven Spielberg always said that he was a fan of Kubrick's script and the idea of a grandiose Napoleonic movie. In 2013, 
He announced his intention of collaborating with the Kubrick family in a project that in 2016 got a green light from HBO to be released as a miniseries with Kari Fukunaga of true detective fame as director. HBO, Spielberg, Fukunaga working with a Kubrick original script. Most likely the series will be released well after 2020 more than half a century since Kubrick had drafted the script and plan. What will happen? How will the series be created and afterwards be perceived by the general public? It's very hard to tell. Yet there is hope, especially for historians and history enthusiasts, that Kubrick's obsession with historical context and detail will be imbued into a series made by a network that generally had made very decent historical drama series from Chernobyl to Deadwood to Rome. With the budgets, staff, writers, and overall quality of television that HBO usually produce, one can hope it will be a remarkable production in whatever form or shape it will be released, either as a miniseries or as an actual series. In the second part of this episode, I'll talk about in detail the script, the plot, synopsis, approaches used with narration, how transitions between periods would be used in Kubrick's original script, and much more. In the third and final part, I'll talk about my own interpretation of how a Napoleon movie, miniseries, or series should be written and produced, and what approach should be taken for such a vast cinematic project. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this first part about Stanley Kubrick's concept for a Napoleon movie. Make sure you stay tuned for the next bits, and I'd like to add that the episode about Suleiman the Magnificent, which kicks off the new series, Rulers of the 16th Century Mediterranean and Europe, will be released after this project about Napoleon and an adaptation of his history in cinema. Make sure you visit my WordPress page for a full piece I wrote on what I call the holy grail of historical cinema and subscribe to the channel to never miss any new material from the podcast. Until the next time, all the best.